case we're in. We need an attorney on that. An elected. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If we could bring the meeting to order, please. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this hearing of the Budget and Finance Committee for Monday, August 26th, uh, 2013. I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, and uh, I am joined today by Council Members Mitchell Englander, Bob Blumenfield, and Mike Bonin, and we are ready to uh, begin today's meeting. Um, we'll be taking public comment prior to the discussion of today's agenda items. And as of this moment, I don't have any general public comment cards. If there's anybody uh, here in the hearing room who'd like to offer public comment, please raise your hand. Uh, I see none, and so general public comment will be closed. Uh, we'll go, uh, actually first, before we do go to closed session, uh, members, I'd like to propose items four, five, and seven as candidates for consent. There's no seven. Oh, is that a typo? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Four, five, and six. Yes. Four, four five. Fourth way. Four, five, and six, uh, unless members have questions or there are cards. There are no cards and no hands going up, so without objection, members, it will be the action of the committee to approve those items on consent. Uh, we'll now go uh, very briefly into closed session. We have one item, uh, and we'll be able to dispose of it, I'm sure, quite quickly. So if you'll excuse us, we're going to go to closed session on item number one. If there's any public comment for item number one, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, public comment on item one is closed. Can I? Did you have questions on one? Do you want to go into closed session? Well, do you... <laughs> All right, we are now back in open session, and we will proceed uh, first, uh, slightly out of order, with item number three. Item number three is the Department of Fire and Police Pensions report relative to the 2011-12 annual report for the Department of Fire and Police Pensions. Mr. Serrano, welcome home. Well, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you uh, very much for taking the opportunity to uh, allow us to come forward and, and sort of uh, talk about some of the good things we've done. The actual item is the 2011-12 annual report, but we also thought this would be a good time for us to just kind of share, give you a little bit, uh, some preliminary results <clears throat> for 12-13, but also kind of talk about some of the things that we have done over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, all good things. So with that, the first um, slide, uh, hopefully everyone has the presentation. If not, I do have extra copies available for folks. So just to, to quickly go over some of the 2011-12 highlights. Um, system assets grew to over $14 billion. <clears throat> Market return, unfortunately, for 11-12 was only 1.89. Our, uh, our pension benefits were are actuarially funded at 83.7, and the health at 37.1%, and combined, they're at 77.7%. Uh, we provided service 11-12 uh, to over 25,000 members, both active uh, and retirees. So uh, some other just notes for 11-12, the city contribution was uh, 441 million, and you add another 3 million for Harbor. And our unfunded liability was a little over $4 billion, comprised of 2.78 in the pension and about $1.5 in health. So flipping the next page, um, a few notes for 12-13. Preliminarily, I'm sorry? The second page? And they should be all double-sided, so in case you flip them too quick. So just preliminarily, our returns, uh, we did well this year, 12.87. This is unaudited at this point, um, but m much better than our 7.75%. Uh, our assets grew to 15.7 billion, and actually, as of today, we're actually over 16 billion. Uh, very good news. Uh, service to our members, again, we're over 25,000 uh, members. And if you may be asking yourselves when we'll get the valuation done, that will be completed in mid-November. Uh, once we get all of our data, uh, we're actually waiting for some of our investment data. We'll be able to do that uh, and give you 
numbers for the 14-15 uh, city's contribution. I think, uh, as you all know, the contribution uh, was, the city's contribution was a little over $500 million for this year, plus another three and some change from Harbor. Uh, likewise, we have employee contributions of a roughly $120 million. Um, one thing that I will talk about a little bit, I know it's, it has come up in the past, uh, about our admin budget and our investment fee budget. Uh, so our admin budget is roughly about $17 million, and our investment um, fee budget is probably, our actual expenditures for last year are probably closer to $80 million. And I'll talk about some good things as we go forward, to sort of give you a little bit more information on, on those numbers. So if there's no questions on 1213, uh, I'd like to flip over to the next slide. And let's talk about some of the things um, that we have done. And, and many, I know this committee has heard some of these actions before. Some of the ways that we've been trying to mitigate city's costs uh, as we looked uh, with the economic crisis back in 2009. Starting in 2009, we adopted a seven-year smoothing. This was at the same time we actually changed the corridor to help the city manage those contributions, uh, given that, that one year that was uh, pretty difficult to manage. We also phased in some assumption changes in 2011, and this was both the medical trend rate uh, assumption and also the decrease from the assumed rate of return from 8% to 7 and 3 quarters. We've also uh, extended the amortization period in this past year, um, which increased that gains and losses from 15 to 20 years and that also had a positive effect on the city's contribution. <clears throat> so thus far, we've probably deferred, and I say deferred, roughly about eight, $380 million uh, to this point. And so it helped the city sort of gradually manage that increase in contributions. However, those are deferred, and it's something that we will have to address going forward. So. Some cost-saving measures uh, in our investment side. Uh, I, with the prior audit from 2007 and other questions by folks, they've asked about sort of what are we doing to help mitigate some of our um, investment fees. They've looked at the system being a little high. So in the slide here we provide just a couple of things, some examples of where we have been looking at trying to mitigate our fees. One, we've been looking at passive management, uh, looking uh, where we can go passive versus active. I think everyone knows most of the passive active management, the fees are quite a bit less than active management. So we've been looking at those opportunities where appropriate. As we look at our asset allocation mix, to look at our risk portfolio, we feel we've been moving slightly into more uh, passive management. And by doing that, then it does reduce uh, many of our investment fees. We've also looked at trying to, in working with lasers and also DWP, is look at ways as we um, manage our investment contracts, whether we can get basically what I want to call multi-system discount. And we've been able to achieve that. Working with the other systems, we've been able to sort of put in place that once one system goes with the contract with a money manager, then the other systems can, for the most part, piggyback on with the same type of fee structure. And likewise, when we are looking at some of the um, high-cost investment strategies, this is really your, um, your hedge funds. We're looking at trying to mitigate some of those, look at those high-cost opportunities. And quite frankly, if we haven't been able to achieve a sufficient research, returns in some of those categories, and we're trying to limit our exposure. Okay. Any questions? So that was... Investment fees. Now, let's a uh, couple of things that we're looking at sort of department-wide. We've looked at um, actually establishing an internal audit group. This actually was put together uh, a couple of years back, and this actually has been one of the, the better strategies that, that has been put in place. For example, we did an, an audit and looking at our drop interest calculation. By looking at when we credit the, the interest calculation to those member accounts, we've actually been able to save roughly half a million dollars um, accumulate in some of the drop interest accounts. We've also looked at uh, giving the, the city what I'll call a credit for the excess benefit plan. Um, before, we would send you a bill and say this was the annually required contribution. 
and then we would add uh, an additional amount for the excess benefit plan. Now we look at crediting that excess benefit against your, ex your ARC payment. Does everyone uh, know what the excess benefit plan is? Those are for those members that make over the IRS um, threshold. I believe the amount for this year is 205. Five. Yep, 205. So if your um, retirement um, payout is over 205, you actually, from the 205 to whatever that higher amount is, is actually paid from an excess benefit plan. There are actually lim IRS limitations when it comes to our pension plan. Okay. Certainly, over the last couple of years, we've been looking at operational best practices, and we've spent a number, uh, significant amount of time in actually looking at our operations and trying to improve them. And so with our strategic planning goals, I listed a couple of things that we thought would be uh, beneficial um, for your information. We're looking to try to get the, the office in a paperless uh, environment. Given all the pension calculations, health documents, this here and there, we're actually trying to move to, a, as much as we can, a paperless environment. And with that, since we have scores and scores of old paper documents, we're in the process of taking those documents, getting them scanned, and setting them up in a repository. So make it easier for staff in multiple sections to access and have that data available uh, as needed to do their job. We're focusing on greater communication and outreach this year. Uh, and one of our, our larger uh, strategic planning goals is actually replacing, assessing it, and ultimately replacing our member and payroll system um, systems. We have two separate system, systems right now. We're looking to try to uh, replace them, merge them into one, and, and go forward let's seamlessly. <clears throat> one of the things I, I believe the department has done a very good job in its investment outreach efforts. And, and I think this is one of the things that probably hasn't been widely um, sort of spread or, or disinformation that's not out there. The system has done a very, very good job on actually what I would call spreading the wealth. Uh, we've been one of the first systems to put together an emerging manager program. And as you can see, we have over the years invested roughly about $4 billion in these four categories. We've been looking at investing where we can in California slash local companies. We've been looking at the minority on, on firms. We've been trying to invest where we can in clean and green type opportunities. And certainly we have some investments in community redevelopment programs. And this is, I think, is a key highlight for, for what Pension has been doing. So we've been looking at trying to, to further some of these goals somewhat quietly, but uh, in order to, to sort of help the city, help the system, uh, achieve the greater goals. A couple current studies that are going on. Um, right now the controller is in the process of wrapping up the um, five-year management audit. The prior audit was, was completed in 2007. It had roughly about 169 recommendations, uh, all of which were considered by uh, the board and the vast majority of them were adopted. The current audit as we understand it, since it's not quite for, uh, finalized yet, that there's roughly about 49 recommendations. Um, I know there was an interim, interim report that was uh, released, but we, we hear the final will have 49. It's going to talk about uh, some of our investment policies. It's going to be looking at some cost-benefit analysis of active versus pa passive management. Uh, it's going to sort of speak to some further consolidation of investment consultants things of that sort. We look forward to the final report and hopefully we'll have that um, by the end of the week, if not next week. As many of you know, we're also in the midst of putting or looking at a new drop, a cost neutrality study, so that's in progress right now. We're also uh, putting, or we have an auditor <clears throat> in place right now to do an actuarial audit. And uh, every few years we get another firm to come in and look at our actuary make sure that all of the assumptions that are going to the actuary are sound, uh, make sense, we're looking at the right uh, demographic data, we're looking at the trends and so forth. I think the one uh, notation on that, um, 
we do hear um, that um, for the actuarial audit for lasers, they have been looking uh, at the rate of return, and there is a suggestion that they look at whether or not that rate needs to be um, further reduced. So just uh, might want to keep that in mind. Okay. I was going to save my question <laughs> until the end, but <laughs> let me just interject. What was the average actual rate of return that the fund realized over the course of the last decade? So for us, and this includes our um, last uh, return un unaudited, but our 10-year average is roughly 7.63. And that was for the decade going back from 2011. That's correct. By the time this year's returns come in, that will actually exceed 7.75 percent if you're unaudited. I, I'm sorry. No, if I was not clear, the 10-year the average that I just quoted you, that includes the 12.67 percent return. Okay. Not to <laughs> argue with you, but my math said 12.6. Uh, I'm 7.6 uh, uh, for the averages that were stated in the report. And since this year is better than the year 20. 2002 was that should go up from there, but okay. Well, well, and once we have final numbers, in any uh, event, we'll it's, it's the decade that included the worst stock market disaster since the Great Depression, and in that 10-year span, we still came within an eyelash of the current actuary uh, mm -hmm. assumed rate of return of 7.75. So the idea of adjusting it downward to me. Um, is completely without any scientific justification whatsoever. Let me just say that, you know, as plainly as I can. So the, the anti-public employee pension demagogues who continue to talk about this aren't looking at the same actual rates of return that I'm looking at when they, they talk about that. So I'm just going to say and, that. And certainly once you get at 20 years or above, then we're at 8 percent and, and even higher. So sorry to take you off the track, but I, I, whenever was expecting I the question and that's talking quite about right. reducing the rate of return, <laughs> I just feel like I need to point out that there has never been a 20-year span in the history of the stock market that has had a return less than 7.75 percent. So, uh, so uh, with the the last slide. Um, here again, this, I knew this was going to come up. So just a couple of areas of concern. There is a pending litigation on the health subsidy freeze, and we'll wait on the outcome of that. Um, the city's contributions uh, will increase uh, due to the prior losses, and I can run over those numbers with you. And here again, there, there, is, there is pressure, like you said, by, by folks to um, lower the return assumption. And the last bullet, which sort of actually lends to the pressure is the GASB accounting changes um, because some of those changes will then lend to sort of increased pressure for, for rates. So with that, in a quick summary, um, as I mentioned, the, our contributions uh, will continue to increase over the, the next few years, but Tier 6 will have an impact in, in helping there. Um, and likewise, I want to emphasize that many of our, if not all of our strategic planning goals are, are geared to reduce costs and increase our oper operational efficiencies of the system. And with that, I do have um, uh, experts with me. I have Bill Raja with me. I have Joe Salazar and also Tom Lopez, our CIO. And we're happy to answer any questions that you may have of us today. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's start with our public safety chair, <clears throat> Mr. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you could just go back and highlight the uh, just the year to date from last year, though, where you indicated that there's a 20 point drop from last year on return, that we were at uh, 20. So yes. Two point oh nine percent. Yes, that, that is correct. So our actual um, return uh, was 1.89 for the 2012 year, and that, that was down from the 22% return we had the prior year. And what, how, can you highlight some of that? And that was um, due to basically the change in the market. You know, we're over 50%, you know, in the equity market, and the main reason for that was the, the lower returns in the, in the equity market. And then you mentioned some of the things that we've invested in as well and expanded our portfolio. Um, 
have we divested in any? Have there been any new policy changes that we've? Well, one of the recent ones okay. was the firearm um, policy, and the board did adopt a uh, a policy on that, and uh, we actually did divest uh, in one of our holdings that we had uh, probably about two months ago. <clears throat> so we so there over time there are policies where we have been put in place for divestment or minimizing our exposure to some of those. So that was one Sudan, section that actually went up this year, but we divested. That's, that's the most recent, that's correct. Public policy perception of what it was, although it's a police pension, investing in assets we purchase, but I understand the overall picture. Yes, it was Smith and Wesson. And then, uh, yes, and um, uh, if you can highlight the drop study, um, and what, do you, what when do you anticipate that, um, and I, you've framed it as a cost neutrality study rather than a cost effective study or what the actual real numbers are. Since there's been a lot of questions out there whether it is truly cost effective or not. If you're doing a cost neutrality study, are those ways to figure out how to describe it as being cost neutral or are you truly doing an independent study on drop as and the effects and the cost period? So the way it's designed, it, it's supposed to be a cost neutral program. But what we are uh, about to embark right now is so we have laid out with the CAO sort of a set of assumptions as far as what needs to be studied. And once we sort of uh, get the okay from the CAO, then we will go to CAO, have them run the numbers. When the numbers come back, then it's going to generate discussion, okay, is it the program truly cost neutral or is it not? Um, once those numbers come back and, for example, if there's a cost to it, then basically the parties are supposed to sit down and have the discussion with the sworn members as what far as how to time, move it back. What kind of time period are you looking at um, of the, that study is in terms of not being complete but going back? How far back are you looking at? Well, we're, we're actually, we usually go back about five years to 2007. Uh, or actually 2005, we're going to look at, at that data. Um, we will take a sort of a prospective approach as well. Once we have the data, Siegel will probably take about six weeks actually complete the study, and then we'll sit down with the CEO to go over the results and have a discussion with them. I know there's a lot of anticipation. It, exactly. When you have over 95% of the members in drop, it, it, it does raise some questions. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield? Yeah. Um, you mentioned the unfunded liability. What was that? You said Roughly as of 11-12, the unfunded was over $4 billion, roughly 4.3, both on pension and then also the health. And once we complete our valuation in November, then we'll have updated numbers on the unfunded liability. But it's much higher on the health side. I'm sorry? It's much higher on the health side? No, the health side is roughly $1.5 billion. On the pension side, it was roughly about $2.7 billion. Um, and uh, any special measures in terms of how we're dealing with that, or we're just? Well, one of the, uh, I, I, I think one thing that needs to be credited to the city, the city has always paid the annual required contribution. And by doing that, you're setting up a payment schedule to basically pay off that unfunded liability over a period of time. If the city was not paying that, then it would be, I think, a, a cause for concern. We're on a good trajectory for that. Already. Yes. The, the city has, has made it a, a high priority to, to pay the annually required contribution uh, in order to just do that, to actually be able to say after a period of time, we would be paying off our liability. Okay. And then the um, <coughs> year 6 and, and 11, is that, um, how has that impacted the, the system? With tier 6 right now, it's created a little bit of savings, um, not uh, probably as much as we would like to see. But once we get more and more members into Tier 6, then the, the cost savings will start accumulating over the years. But at the moment, it's still too new to really see any. Uh, exactly. We, we have so few members in Tier 6 right now, it, it's, it's a small number. And, and I assume, you know, I'm always trying to figure out the relationship with LACERS and DWP's pension system, and, and are you sharing best practices, and how is all that working in terms of Managing, costs, uh, very, splitting, 
Very much so. We actually have a very good relationship with Lacers, and we do communicate with DWP as well. Like I mentioned, one of the I, I think one of the big cost drivers has always been investment management fees, and so for for us to come to an agreement, like okay, if you particular fund A actually um, has a new agreement with the money manager, and you've negotiated these costs, then basically the other systems can share when those costs uh, in those low rates, and and we have. Tom has done a, a fabulous job and just going back and forth a lot of these these managers to, to reduce costs and to reduce as, those fees as much as we can. And is that related, you mentioned there was a $17 million in administrative cost and then $80 million in investment fees, that's correct. And the $17 million is referring to what? It is just our regular admin budget with staffing, our contribution to health care, things of that sort. That seems like a large percentage. Is that, and, and I ask that out of ignorance, not not trying to criticize. I'm just is that is that in line? It, that's in line. One of the things that we do because we're sort of a trust, um, we actually pay for health care. For example, where most departments don't, we actually pay you know reimburse the city for whatever the act of basically my health care, staff's health care, things of that sort, workers' comp, things of those areas. So that's why it does seem a little bit higher than some other departments, because they don't actually pay health care directly. Okay. That just kind of jumped out at me. As a it's one of those things where the city sort of makes us pay, like all good proprietary departments. <laughs> you guys all ask my question. Um, on the uh, actuarial funding level for pension benefits and health benefits uh, that you've described on slide two. How do those uh, funding levels compare to our other pension systems and pension systems generally across California? Actually, I think we are still one of the best funded systems. Um, we've, so we, we've had a, we had a good return, um, and once we get the valuation, we'll see where we end up. Uh, based on last year's numbers, you know, our funded ratio was going to come down slightly as we sort of absorb all those losses. I'm hoping with this good return that we had this year, that reduction will, will, will sort of decrease and will stay in the mid-70s on, on a combined ratio. But still, 75, 77 percent, it's, it's a lot better than a lot of systems um, across the state or even across the country. Okay. Um. And uh, the seven-year smoothing policy and the phased-in assumption changes that, that you talked about, how do those compare to, I mean, is, I'm trying to get a sense of, for lack of a better phrase, best practices. What, what would be the typical policy if you looked at pension funds across California for smoothing and, uh, and for assumption changes? You know, a lot of systems prior to the market crash, most, most of them had a, a five-year smoothing. Their corridors um, for upper and lower were, were 80 percent to 120. But with the significant crash, I think systems not only across the state, across the country had to really look at some of their, their funding and smoothing policies. And so uh, both lasers and um, pensions, we went to a seven-year smoothing open up the corridor to sort of help mitigate sort of the large increase. Uh, I think what's important to, for folks to remember, if you have a very tight corridor or a very small um, smoothing sort of methodology or window, when you have significant lo losses or even gains, you're going to see this volatility that's very difficult to manage. And as far as the city is concerned when it came to pensions and lasers, uh, it, it, it was best practice. We, we ran it through Siegel, other advisors, and made sense. Um, everything is in the norm, but it just allowed the city to sort of manage that volatility that we would have otherwise seen um, starting in 2009-10. Do you know offhand what it is for CalPERS or CalSTRS? Or does the um, assembly, former assembly budget chair happen to know? <laughs> it, they have a 15-year smoothing. Actually. 15-year. Wow. That's that's it's a little long. 
Um, and then finally, I, I really appreciate the um, slide indicating the $4 billion that are invested in a variety of areas that are important to California and, and to the city. Um, do you know offhand, and if not, could you please report back, of that $4 billion, how much is actually invested in local firms, in L.A. County firms or real estate? Because that's one of the subcategories, but it's not broken out within the $4 billion. And I, that's an area of special concern of mine, what our pension funds are doing to create jobs in the Los Angeles Basin. And so um, if you could let us know that. Sure. And I think it would be an important thing to have <clears throat> in future reports, actually. Um, and let's see if I had anything else. Oh, um, in terms of investment performance, on page 55 of your report, you indicate that the fund was ranked in the 35th percentile for the one-year period, the 24th percentile for the three-year period, 72nd percentile for the five-year, and 29th percentile for the seven-year period. So, so for all, of, all but one of those periods, we're, our investment performance is faring poorer than average. Um, so what do you attribute that to? Should we be making, I know, noticed there were some changes in some of the investment management firms already. What other changes can we be doing to at least get up to, get up to average on, on investment return? Well, I'd, I'd say, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think we're sort of tend to be a, a little bit higher. Uh, you know what? In putting together sort of an asset allocation and where you um, allocate money, you look at your risk tolerance. Um, you know, one of the things that's in, important, um, we, we have been growing. Our assets have been growing. We, we had a very good year. Um, the prior year was so-so was uh, and quite frankly below where we wanted to be. You know, when you tend to have a greater allocation in equities, then you're somewhat mirrored you know, you know, with what happened in the stock market. Now, there's other strategies to sort of mitigate that, and that's where you'll, you have money in your fixed income portfolio, your bonds, et cetera. Uh, we've been putting money in real estate. Uh, we actually have going forward an allocation to commodities to hope then start hedging against some of inflation at some point. Um, you know, it's, if we all had a crystal ball, then we would be 100% funded, if not more. Um, we, we certainly look at the opportunities where we um, can get a return and, and are trying to minimize some that we're not. And, and I'll just, I guess one of the ones that I will mention is over the years we've had money in hedge funds, but if you look at the investments that we've had and, and some of the returns of those hedge funds over the period, they've, they've done less than 2%. 2% is not seven and three quarters. Um, so we are looking, we've actually started moving our money out and we're gonna look to see where we can place our money so we have a better return on investment. You, and by asking this, I'm not <clears throat> second guessing particular investment decisions because you're right, without a crystal ball, nobody really is, is uh, able to do that. It's just that the majority of public funds in the RV Cunes public fund universe are getting a higher rate of return. So I'm wondering, you know, are there practices that they've adopted that we need to adopt? Is there a philosophy? Maybe we are not being prudent by being overly prudent, for example. Um, and I, I, think, I think it should be a goal to at least get up to that 50th percentile across all time frames. And, you know, all of our funds, I think, should be... At, at least doing the average, unless there's some mm -hmm. structural reason that we're uh, in an adverse position to the majority of other funds. Now, all this I, I wholeheartedly here. agree, and um, you know, sometimes it depends on the board dynamics. You know, we we've had several years ago we had a board that was let's put money in hedge funds and some other uh, type of investments. Uh, that's not to say that they were wrong or did anything um, sort of with that direction. But you make a valid point, I mean, where we want to make sure that our universe and, and where we place our assets invest and that we get a, a significant return. If our universe of investment is shrunk for whatever reason, 
policy-wise, what have you, then it becomes that much more difficult to, to sort of achieve a, a the given return. But we will, as you mentioned, it is a, is a, a continuous goal, and we will continue to look for those opportunities. All right. Anything further, members? Yeah, Mr. Blumenfield. One of your questions, sort of a follow-up on it, which is about the um, you meant the, the categories that you're invested in, and you were asking about the percentages, and it sort of made me wonder what is the what is the lens that you use to to make those investments and decide on those categories besides rate of return, which is the obvious fiduciary responsibility and compliance with with various state laws in terms of divesting and local laws, whether it's firearms or the Iran divestments and things like that. How, what is the lens that you use to make sure that you're investing in these categories and, and even if you don't have the percentages? So the board adopts sort of an, an asset allocation mix and, and just, <clears throat> so we, we may have sort of 50% in, in the equity and this is sort of core and small cap and international. We have, you know, 22% for our bonds. 9% is real estate. We have 13% for some of the, what I'll call alternative investments, which is private equity and hedge funds. We have a 5% allocation to commodities and, and then 1% in cash. Um, Tom and his staff go through these, and working with the board. And that breakdown is just, I mean, is that just sort of historical what you've had, or, or is that a targeted breakdown? The process that we go through, I'm Tom Lopez, the Chief Investment Officer, is virtually identical to all over public pension funds in, in the country. And every three to five years, and it's part of our investment policy, we go through uh, an exercise called an asset allocation. Um, in that, uh, and we do it through, some funds will have their own computer models, others use their consultant's model, We'll use the consultants, um, go through, and they look at the capital market assumptions, and frankly, those are, you know, guesses since they're trying to predict the future. They look at the past relationships between different asset classes, and they look at the uh, risk that's associated with each of those asset classes. And sometimes these models are called optimizers, and it's a large equation, and they're seeking to balance the rate of return with the risk as measured by the standard deviation. And in other words, how much about a particular asset class bounces around. And then they're also seeking to maximize the diversification. So it, the model is looking for relationships that will zig when something else zags. And, it, and once again, that word, it optimizes that function and this is a, not one particular point, but it's really a continuum of points on what's called the efficient frontier. And the board looks at that, and depending at their own tolerance for risk or preferences for certain asset classes, they can pick any point along this line and come up with what's eff effectively an efficient asset allocation that maximizes your return for the amount of risk and the amount of... Um, at what point in that, I mean, and I understand that process. Okay. Do we get, do we get to the, the investment categories that are listed here about local hires, minority-owned firms, green and clean, technology, and, and so you've got to overlay that on your, your risk management and your, your, your return on investment issues, and it's, it's unclear to me how you, how, you, how you mesh those two together. Those are sub-asset class decisions. So once we've decided that we're going to be investing in private equity, when we get around to structuring the private equity portfolio and working with the advisor we've hired there, we can say, look, these are the types of funds we're interested in. The one, we want, want the best return we can get, but since there are a lot of funds out there, keep an eye out for these criteria as well. So if there's a green fund in the marketplace or if there's an LA fund or a California fund that invests mostly in California, we have a sub-program in the private equity portfolio that uh, 
invests in just those categories. So we look for smaller, newer managers, managers that are based in L.A. or investing within the city, managers that are investing in California. So those are decisions that once the large framework is created, then those are handled down at the, the asset class level. And that spreads out to any of the asset classes. So for you know, domestic equity or real estate or bonds, all of those things, once you create the structure of the asset class, can be added in there as criteria for the, uh, the selection of managers. Anything further, members? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So we're just noting and filing? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, that brings us now to item number two, our nominee. Item number two is communication from the Mayor and City Ethics Commission relative to the appointment of Emmanuel Pletus to the Board of Fire Police Pension Commissioners. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. And congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, why don't you start by um, just giving a brief overview of your background and sure. how you see it relating to your work on the, on the board. Absolutely. Well, thank you for, for the opportunity. Uh, to, to address you today, and I and, uh, don't have a, a long address prepared, except for saying that I'm excited uh, to, to be here and, and to take this awesome responsibility of, of being a commissioner for one of the, for the, our biggest pension fund in the city of Los Angeles and one of the bigger ones um, across the country. Uh, my background is, uh, I'll start with, uh, I was born and raised in the city of Los Angeles and uh, raised mainly on the east side, born in the south side of LA in the inner city. Um, I have, in my professional career, um, uh, um, done work inside of the financial services industry. Uh, however, when doing that work, always having a light of, um, you know, whose assets are we really investing and where are returns actually going, um, having a very critical eye. In fact, I, my own studies were more in the kind of public policy sphere and education space, uh, but I wanted to understand where assets came from and how money was created and how eventually it returned to the people that... Uh, we're, we're doing the actual work. Um, so I think that's how I think about things and how I, uh, I'm going to proceed with any job. Uh, my specific work in the space is that I worked at Goldman Sachs doing um, equities. I was in an equities um, group. So what I actually worked on was, um, you know, counseling, advising, and, and selling uh, equity products to pension funds, institutional funds, um, across the country and around the world, but mainly investing in U.S. equities. So just to be specific in terms of my expertise, uh, um, other professional experiences I've had is specifically um, working in the U.S. Treasury Department where I uh, uh, reported to the Chief Economist of the President and thought about um, how, um, you know, how we thought about growth uh, from a country perspective um, and how the assets of our country are invested in to actually have a real return um, you know, based on the investments that we're thinking about on a, on a federal level. Um, and most recently, I worked at a consulting firm called McKinsey & Company, uh, where part of my work uh, within the company, aside from kind of micro-level work, where I worked inside of companies in the biotech, energy, uh, private equity, retail banking space, I actually did a study on long-term rates of return for different asset classes in equity and fixed income. And um, you have had, it came with some interesting um, observations because everyone does their models in their own way, uh, but, but definitely kind of in line with what, you know, I'll be doing at least have a, have a view or perspective on as a commissioner. So that's my background. And the, the most recent thing before running for mayor of Los Angeles uh, myself as a candidate, uh, I was a uh, chief strategist for a tech company and kind of, you know, got exposure to kind of new trends, new economies that were being created, um, in, in how do you think about investing your capital in those spaces. So that's my background. Uh, but uh, more than anything, I'm excited to be here and excited to be uh, nominated for, for this commissioner position. And, you know, I... I think it's, again, an, an awesome responsibility to be a commissioner for such a large fund and that uh, is supposed to advance the health and retirement security of um, you know, our firefighters and police officers. Very good. Thank you. Um, when you were running for mayor, you kind of sounded the alarm about yep. uh, some of the unfunded liability challenges yes. that our pensions have and, and spoke 
uh, frequently about the need for reform. Mm -hmm. What kinds of reforms would you like to concentrate the most on as a, now that you would be uh, uh, in a position to be able to do so as a, as a commissioner? Sure. So I, I, I'm, I would enter this role with no a particular agenda. Obviously, I had an agenda that I put forth as a candidate. Um, I, I want to make sure that, that I really dig deep in terms of the things that they're already doing. Um, I actually learned a few things just in this last presentation of some of the things that they're working on, uh, from the smoothing policy to lurking, looking at emerging managers uh, to some of the cost um, initiative, cost saving initiatives um, within the fund for, from administrative costs, but also the fees that are, that are being um, that investment managers are assessing us. So I don't have a particular agenda that I'm going to lay forth right now because I want to make sure that I think of this as more of a blank slate and coming in and, and really looking at what they're already doing. And then from there, having more specific points of view on, on what we can do. And I'd love to you know, consult over time with uh, folks in this committee as well as the rest of the city council and, and obviously the mayor's office. Um, you know, If there was something that I'd put forward right now is that I'm I'm very, very interested in the emerging manager program and how we think about that and how I think you need to, you, you must do the overall framework at the top level, but then really figure out how to overlay it in a manner where you're looking at companies within LA that fit into all these different buckets, right? Whether it's just US large cap or US small cap equity uh, to other types of investments. But, but thinking in a long-term perspective in terms of what this fund is, how we're returning for police officers and firefighters that are living in the city of Los Angeles. And I think that's how I want to be thinking about some of the things like the Emerging Manager Program. I think in cost cutting, I think it's an interesting debate in terms of passive versus active. Uh, that, that uh, you know, yes, passive is, is less fees, and I think we could embark on a strategy to just move towards passive. But, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're, that, that you're not losing out on some of the advantage that you could have from an active manager. So I, um, I'm not... Uh, you know, I, I'm, gonna, I'm saying right now that I'm not leaning one way or the other, and I just think it's a very interesting debate that, that we, as a pension fund, can be a thought leader in that space for other pension funds across the country. And, and without judging what's happened in the past, I want to make sure that we at least take that initiative to be thought leaders in how we're looking at different asset classes and how we're looking at passive versus active uh, investing. So um, I'll stop there uh, without trying to lay out a, a more robust agenda. All right. Well, I appreciate your kind of drawing a distinction between agenda you might have as, as a mayor and as exactly. a commissioner. One of the in, in, uh, ideas that you had proposed uh, during the mayor was this, was the buyout plan. Mm -hmm. um, I know that the mayor has expressed that he's not supportive of, of such a plan, so I'm, I shouldn't assume. Um, maybe you could just reconcile sure. that if you can. Say, so what, what would you see your role as, uh, as a member of the commissioner mm -hmm. with regard to a large-scale reform sure. like that where you have an idea with which the mayor disagrees? So um, I'll say this. I, I am for looking at, at ways that we could address the unfunded liabilities that have not been considered in the past. Um, so if it's a pension buyout or something else, I am open to considering it. I did propose it during the campaign. However, a pension buyout isn't just the pension fund. It would involve um, the mayor, the city council, agreeing on a bunch of other things and a bunch of other details that uh, um, you know, would need to be hashed out. It's not an it's not a uncomplicated thing. And, and, and so as a commissioner, one, I don't have uh, particular authority to even um, necessarily try to put all those pieces together by myself. Uh, however, I will say that I'm open to, to other things to consider that are outside the box that have not been considered in the past. And quite frankly, I, I also say that with, say with not knowing exactly what has been considered in the past before, I know that uh, there's been, you know, they, you know, everyone's been thinking about this for a long time. And I think there's been different ideas that have been put forward. Uh, I want to make sure that we are looking at it because um, although I, I would say is that we are one of the better uh, funded pension funds out there in the country, uh, so we do, you know, we should pat ourselves in the back, at least in a comparative way. Uh, there is still an unfunded liability that we do need to address. And, and again, um, I do think we need to look at it, and I'm going to be open to, to things that maybe not have been considered in the past. Great. Um, members? Mr. Bloomfield? Um, well, a couple things. Just on that same point about the unfunded liability. I mean, we yes. Were just asking about that earlier. And saying, well, we're, we're breaking our payments, and we're on a fairly good trajectory uh, dealing with that. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that that is a, the adequate trajectory, or are you suggesting that, that we need to go much further? So in, in a comparative perspective, absolutely yes. 
uh, again, comparative to other pension funds out there. Um, should we do more? Uh, I, I will say that, yes, we do need to do more because there's still an unfunded liability. However, from a trajectory perspective, you know, are they taking adequate measures and are we going in the right direction? Absolutely. And of course, there's always every, you know, everything has a reaction. So you, you do more on one side, you may, you may have some negative actions on the other side in terms of you know, the, the liabilities of moving too quickly on, on the liabilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's always an adverse effect that could happen, you know, and, and then you need to, that's why you need to carefully consider everything. And, and that's why I think any, any big, ma any major reform decision would have to involve the mayor's office, the city council, and a, a, a real thorough review of, of kind of what's actually out there, different ideas that have been proposed and have been executed in different parts of the country. And then uh, one more thing, just, I understand you don't want to put the agenda forward because mm -hmm. you're not a candidate anymore as a commissioner. But what do you perceive are the biggest challenges or opportunities that are before the, the commission? That's a great, uh, great question. Again, you know, without uh, a robust uh, agenda here um, that I would lay out, I, I would say that um, re I think there's so uh, kind of I'll take a major step back. Kind of uh, portfolio allocation theory over the last uh, uh, half a century um, was questioned. Uh, in the last few years. And, and I think that there's still not a real verdict out in terms of what's the right way forward. And I think pension funds and other institutional funds have had, uh, are still in an active debate on how you think about that in terms of what is the right allocation, what, you know, is, is, the, is, the, is the right model to, to determine uh, asset allocation, you know, and how you think of your risk profile. Um, I think there's still very active debate out there. And I, and I, and I um, as a commissioner, um, would like to make sure that the pension fund, that our pension fund for fire and police, um, is active in that debate and that, that we're not just taking a, seat, a, a back seat and waiting to see what other people are saying of how this is adjusting, but actually, you know, making sure that we're putting our thoughts out there and, 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 and identifying what in the next five to ten years is going to be kind of the asset allocation outlook. Um, by different pension funds. So I, I, I say it's, it's a very kind of, uh, you know, high-level uh, statements here, but, it, but I say is that there's still a lot of things that have not been worked out um, since the financial crisis, since the huge market crash. Um, you know, from long-term rates of return, I mean, you can look at rates of return for 10 years, you can look at it for 20 years, and then you've got to think of equity and, and fixed income and, and whether or not, uh, you know, you can say that equity, the stock market has returned um, over time, a higher than 7.5% re uh, return, but then how much percent are we putting in the stock market? Right? And, then, and, and that's still not that out because you need to then assess what your risk profile is. So I think there's still, again, without laying out an agenda here, there's still a lot of debate and stuff that still hasn't been worked through, but I would like the Alley Fire and Police Pension Fund to not sit back and make sure that we're thought leaders, that at least we're proposing, that we're bringing folks who are really looking at this in a very analytical way, uh, you know, to LA so that we're first movers in any types of these strategies moving forward. So, so the biggest issue is the asset allocation and mm -hmm. how that gets rejiggered over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And is, is a big piece of that the equities piece in terms of... Being yeah, I mean, a, a, a equity has, there, there's different types of equity and, and I think that um, before it was very simple, it's kind of, you know, U.S., domestic, international, and then you kind of think small and large. Uh, but there's different ways of thinking about equity, which is, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's the ownership of, a, of any company, right? And, and I think you go public and private, and there's a bunch of things that, that are there that I think are still not, um, it, it, there's been a lot of thought to it, but, but there's, there's no one right way to do it. And I think we need to um, be open to, to looking at different strategies that we haven't considered in the past. Just one question. Uh, Mr. Krikorian asked a question I was going to ask about the, the buyout program. Mm -hmm. you, you talked, though, in your answer to that about wanting to uh, look outside the box uh, for, for other proposals, other things we can look mm -hmm. at. Anything in particular you want to go out on a limb on and mention today? Uh, no, nothing I have, I have today. I mean, I think, I think um, the buyout is kind of on one extreme. And, and I think you, you know, I mean, DROP itself is, is, a, is a program that that was thought about, that was put forth, that is different than, than you know, not all pension funds have that. Um, and so I think there's, there's a continuum of those types of, of ideas um, so that you can, you know, have workers that could either, whether you want to give them more options or you want to just provide, uh, you know, what, more tiers, uh, whatever you want to call it, there's, there's more to consider. But again, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to lay out any particular one that I think is, is the better one. 
R Rick was here, and I was just trying to see if I could give him something for his story for deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to uh, commend you. This is the first time I've ever heard a presentation from a McKinsey alum that did not involve PowerPoint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I have a... I, even though I'm, um, I feel pretty good at creating PowerPoint presentations, uh, given my my career, that I'm not I'm not a fan of them. I think the the human element, you know, sometimes gets lost. Mr. Uh, there's nothing further, members. Um, it, I would propose that we uh, advance the uh, nominee to council, and uh, without objection, that will be the action of the committee. So thank you. We'll see you in council. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And I think that brings us to the conclusion of our business. So there being nothing further before the committee, we are adjourned.